All right? Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm Ibrahim Sisse. I'm an associate professor in the physics department at MIT. And I'm very excited to be here, actually, for many different reasons. So first of all, you know, I was a graduate student also in uh, uh, NSF Physics uh, uh, Frontier Center. So a lot of the ideas that I'm going to tell you about today were actually born out of, uh, you know, discussions in my own PhD uh, with uh, Tech Chip Ha at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I would like to tell you about how these ideas have evolved and now meeting some of the concepts that uh, Rick have, has told you about uh, just earlier today. And the second reason is that, you know, rarely do I get to go to a conference where, um, you know, one of the organizers is from exactly where I'm from also, which is Niger in West Africa. Can anyone guess which of the organizers is from Niger? <laughs> they say Jose. <laughs> Brazil might be like Africa, but, <laughs> but not Niger. I wish I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so Kraston actually uh, went to school in Niger. Uh, so very, very few people know about it. So you should ask him about uh, his time there uh, in his formative years. Um, so, and I was also talking with uh, some of the students and postdocs yesterday. Can I see maybe a show of hands if we're talking yesterday at the reception? Yeah? Okay, good. So, I was asking them what would they want to hear, of, you know, in the workshop today as I'm talking. And they told me that they want to hear about super resolution and single molecule imaging in live cell, yes? Okay. But then they say, they don't just want that. They also want specific examples of how super resolution and single molecule imaging in live cell, you know, can teach us something new in gene expression regulation. Is that correct? And then they say they don't also just want that. They also want to see how that will help address some of the key concepts in phase separation biology. So this is a lecture about not just Oh, oh, this is not advancing, so let's see. Not just about super resolution single molecule imaging, but about chromatin and gene expression regulation, but also maybe about phase separation as well. I told them, of course, that this is exactly what my lab works on. This is 100% of what my lab works on. So if I present this to you today, then what would I present to you on Monday in my uh, regular talk? They say they don't mind seeing the same, some of the same slide come back, but I should talk about this today. So students always win, and that's what we're going to talk about, all right? So what my lab is interested in is to understand how cooperativity emerges in systems that involve weak and transient interactions. As you know, problems that involve many different components can be very intricate to understand from first principle in physics. And this is especially true if the different components have an interaction between them. Now, even if these interactions are of very low affinity, as you know, sometimes the system can exhibit a collective behavior where the whole can do more than the sum of the individual components. This kind of emergent phenomena, we know control complex dynamical systems at the macroscopic level. And when we started our group, what we suspected was that that's also how our genome self-regulates. If only we can go down to that level and uncover these processes with sufficient quantitative details. So what we do in my lab is that we leverage our expertise in single molecule techniques going directly inside living cells, often time to unveil that these processes even exist inside a living cell. And then we push ourselves, both in terms of uh, the microscopy, the physics, and the biology, to uncover their function and their mechanisms of action in vivo. So for students, I usually say that uh, these uh, collective behaviors, right, there are some that happen even in living cells that can be visualized by the naked eye, right? For example, an ant colony carrying a large amount of food, or here a school of fish that dynamically reorganizes into clusters to avoid being food here to a predator that comes in from the right. But of course, the one we'll be talking about today will require us to start from the human scale, zoom in first a million fold 
And that brings us inside the cell to an area around the cell nucleus. So some of you may be able to make out that there is an oval shape in the middle, but the picture becomes very blurry very quickly. And this is because you're trying to image very rapidly at the very limit of optical microscopy. So the techniques we'll talk about and that my lab adopts and further develops for our specific purposes are the single molecule based super resolution techniques which would break the optical diffraction limit to reveal in finer detail the organization of the biomolecules within. So in particular, we may care about some of these clusters. We can take some of the largest ones inside the cell nucleus, zoom in another order of magnitude, and notice how now the scale bar is one wavelength of visible light. And at this scale, you can see not just individual biomolecules, which are really some of the dimmest spots here, but when the molecules come together and form these clusters, which is, we represent here in a red hot color code. So throughout this talk, even the largest clusters that I'll be telling you about are of the order of a few, a couple hundred nanometers or so. Okay. So what's the molecule of interest? We've heard about it. It's RNA polymerase II. It's the molecular complex that is responsible for the synthesis of all messenger RNA in all eukaryotes. So if you are a physicist, and in particular a physics student, and uh, you join uh, a lab for the first time, and I tell you we want to study RNA polymerase too, we want to study transcription process, you know, go find out what you can about it. And what most students will do is to go on Google. And they check on Google, and Google tells them that transcription is a well understood process, it's completely solved. And in particular, you may even see cartoons like this, right, that represent uh, at least how we teach how transcription happens. So I'm not sure if this is uh, playing. Sorry, Zan USA in just escape. Yeah, there you go. Okay, good. So. Okay, polymerase may not have a specific DNA recognition domain, right? So it has to be assisted by a general factor that would first bind. And once this general factor is bound, then polymerase may be recruited. And according to the textbook model, the polymerase will be diffusing around and then will have to be recruited uh, here by this general factor. And here's the polymerase in green. And once this polymerase is recruited, dozens of other cofactors come in. And in this cartoon, they just magically fly in from the right. But once the pre-initiation complex is formed, a distal region, the enhancer loops around, comes in, releasing the polymerase, right, which can then track on the DNA like a train on the railroad, which would unwind this double helix, reveal the series of letter codes ATGCs, which it copies into an RNA copy coming out in yellow here. So however elaborate this cartoon may seem, it's still just that, right? It's a cartoon. It's too simplistic and perhaps even wrong. The reality is that there is no method of microscopy that would allow you to uncover such a dynamic process with uh, sufficient detail. And I think the problem has to do with what we mean when we say we can see single molecules. So represented here, for instance, is the green fluorescent protein, right? It absorbs blue light and emits green light. The molecule itself has a Stokes radius of one to two nanometers. But of course, when you say we're looking at the molecule, what you're actually seeing is light emitted by that molecule. Light being a wave, it will diffract of the order of the wavelength of that emission. So in reality, what you see is this big blob that is two orders of magnitude larger than the actual size of the molecule. Right. So if you want to clearly make out multiple molecules, they better be separated by more than the wavelength of light, right? or more than 100 times their actual sizes. So the implications for this, as we will talk about soon, in uh, the resolution limit has been well thought about. But what I will suggest to the students is that there is another limitation that people do not think about 
which is a limitation on the concentration of biochemical reactions that can happen. To see a single molecule, you've effectively diluted right, one molecule every 500 nanometers. So you can do that back of the envelope calculation. Right? One molecule, let's say in a sphere of radius of 500 nanometers, and then see what effective local concentration that gives you. You cannot go above that local concentration if you truly want to see a single molecule. So do, I would I ask my students to do that, and I encourage all the students here to do that also. And what you get is that the maximum concentration is about three nanomolar. So when someone builds a very efficient single molecule technique, right, they're building a machine that is great at seeing the tip of the iceberg on some of the most stable interactions. Those that will require an effective concentration of less than this. Many of you would know that for many biomolecular, uh, for, for many biomolecules inside, especially eukaryotic cells, they exist at micromolar concentrations, right? And if you're talking about phase separation, you're talking about tens to hundreds of micromolar concentration. So many single molecule techniques, even some of the best ones, are not readily able to, to detect these. In fact, single molecule techniques are inherently incapable of detecting things at high concentration. You will see something, but what you see is only the uh, highest, um, the, the highest affinity interactions. Is this okay? Okay. But the implications, as I say, for the resolution, spatial resolution limit, has been well studied and well characterized, right? So the idea is that the opposite would be true, that if you can separate your detections even in time, you certainly can localize the center with nanometer accuracy. And that's the principle behind single molecule based super resolution techniques. They use the fact that you can turn molecules on and off to reconstruct a picture here at the bottom that is much sharper than what conventional microscopes resolve at the top. Okay? These techniques go by many acronyms. You've probably he heard of uh, palm and serum photoactivation localization microscopy, uh, stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy, and they've been really the object of uh, many uh, prestigious prizes, including the Nobel Prize in Chemistry and the Breakthrough Prize in uh, 2018. So, for our purpose, right, let's think a bit more about practically how these techniques would work so that we can think about what the limitations even of these high resolution techniques might be. So, imagine your biomolecules are organized in a certain structure that you're trying to visualize. So, what you would do, you would densely label your biomolecules to try to see them. But if your molecules are close together, closer than the diffraction limit, then if you use a conventional microscope where all molecules are on at the same time, then the fluorescence will just over overlap, and what you see is this big blur, right? So with super resolution, you forego seeing all the molecules together. In fact, you go to a case where virtually all the molecules are off, and you turn on just randomly a small subset. You can then localize their center, record the position of their centers, wait for them to go off, and then wait for another random set to come on. So at no point do you get the full picture. In each frame, all you get is a series of single molecule localization. But if you wait long enough, then you may get enough localizations that maybe you can reconstruct a final picture. So what would happen then if your biomolecules start to move around? You don't get the picture that you intended, right? So for that simple reason, even in the single molecule field, we had come to accept the super resolution techniques to work only for things that are fairly static if you want to look at them inside living cells, or we have to fix the cell to look at the substructures. 
That means that we take a cell, right? We will use a chemical crosslinker like paraformaldehyde that crosslinks all the biomolecules together. The cell will be dead, but we'll get a snapshot of the organization of all the biomolecules. Okay. So I just started though by telling you that the motivation in our lab is to look at substructures that happen below the diffraction limits. So we would need the super resolution techniques, but they also tend to involve weak and transient interactions. So they can be highly dynamic, right? So our first order of business was to figure out how we would even be able to do these super resolution techniques, but for highly dynamic processes directly inside living cells. Okay. So something would have to give, right? We have to be a bit more clever than, than even just the conventional super resolution approach. So I'll tell you about one approach, which uh, is a time correlated uh, uh, super resolution analysis, now most commonly known as TC Palm, where we say if we care about not just where we localize the molecule, but the time at which the molecule is localized, we can use that temporal information to infer on the dynamics. So how would that work? So you're now trying to create a picture like this, which is showing you that polymerase two, RNA pol two, is forming clusters in the nucleus of a living cell. So then you should ask, how long did it take to build a picture like this? Well, this one took about 10,000 frames, each frame at 50 milliseconds. So about eight minutes to build a picture like this. So during the eight minutes, if I tell you that there is a cluster here, it could be something that was always there, that you stochastically activated and detected one molecule at a time, right? Or something that dynamically assembled and disassembled during the eight minutes. This final picture doesn't tell you that. So with TC Palm, what we suggested was simple. Take this cluster. If this is something that was always there and you stochastically activated and detected it one molecule at a time, then if you look at the temporal history of your detections, it should obey a statistic that is consistent with the stochastic process. Right? So in fact, if I want to know what a stable cluster looks like, then I can do this exact same imaging, but in a fixed cell. right? And that will give me an idea of the temporal history for a cluster where there is no dynamics. So that's what I'm going to show you first. So this is information coming from a cluster, but in a fixed cell, right? And then here, here's how we're plotting the information. So it's for a specific region in a fixed cell. And we look within that region, how many detections do you get per frame? It's typically one or zero. That's the condition for single molecule localization. But in the beginning, when you get such high concentration, sometimes you may get two or three, right? And the x-axis here is time, right? 10,000 frames at 50 millisecond per frame. That's the 500 seconds. So, it's the same information that you have here at the bottom, but represented in a cumulant form. Every time you get a detection, you go up by one. It's a function that will always increase, right? But now it's the slope that indicates the frequency at which you're getting detections. So in the beginning, you get a such high concentration, you also get a high slope. But over time, as you start to deplete your pool of photoconvertible molecules, you get a lower and lower frequency of detections, and that translates into this gradual plateau. Yes? Uh, I don't know much, it's quite the naive, but is the idea that each photoactive one can only blink once? Yes. So, so the, the idea here, there are a few technical di uh, differences between say photoactivation localization microscopy and stochastic optical reconstruction microscopy. 
So with photoactivation localization microscopy, historically it's based on the fluorescent proteins that, are, that have less of a photon budget. Right? So if you activate a molecule, then it will emit up to a photon budget, then it goes off. Right? So for palm, typically, you activate the molecule, it shines bright, and then it goes off. With storm, it's a bit different. So historically, it's with organic dyes that have a much greater photon budget, and they tend to live longer. And there, the stochasticity comes in, in the fact that they come on for a short period, they go off, and the same molecule comes back again. And that's called blinking. So molecules here may still blink, but the essential idea is that, really, you, you get a vote, and, and, and you're pretty much gone. Other questions? Okay. So this is what we expect, right, for a static cluster, a stable cluster. This is the signature that we would expect. A slope from the beginning of acquisition suggesting that from the time that you started recording, there was a high concentration there, and then followed by you know, a gradual plateau that suggests that over the time of your imaging, of course, you start to deplete your pool of detectable molecules. Now we can go back to the data inside a living cell and look specifically at this cluster. So let's just focus at this one here. So how does the temporal data look like in this case? So notice here, in this particular region, right, for the first minute and a half, there is virtually no detection. No detection does not mean that there was no protein there, but that the local concentration was likely too low, such that your probability of photoactivating and detecting a molecule was negligible during that period of time. Right? And then when a cluster does assemble, you get this high frequency of detection. Based on our fixed calibration, we know what should happen if the cluster actually stayed there for you to photoactivate and detect all the molecules, you would expect this thing to start increasing and then over time it would plateau, right? But what we see is a short period of time after a cluster seems to have assembled and you start to get this high frequency of detection, it also seems to disassemble. So what TC Palm seems to reveal a signature for a very dynamic clustering process inside these living cells. Any question about that? Is that clear? Yeah. How would you be able to detect the disassembly of a cluster that is already there at the time of imaging? Right. So the idea is this. If you start imaging and a cluster is there, you are photoactivating and detecting uniformly. So the probability of detecting one molecule after the next will depend then on how many molecules were there at the time. And that is given by whatever you calibrated in your fixed cell sample. So once a cluster, if a cluster is there, then you know that there is a high probability after you detect this molecule that another molecule will be turned on. Right, so you start to get this high frequency of detection. But once the cluster is gone, then you don't get that high frequency of detection. So it doesn't mean that, you know, if you don't see something that there is no molecule there, it just means that you no longer have that high concentration there. Okay. But how do you discriminate if you or disassemble? That's also a very good question. So once a cluster has formed, right, then what's, what's the difference between a, de a depletion and a disassembly? So for that, we have to be a bit more deeper into the photoconversion process that we picked. So what's the stochasticity that you're trying to achieve? Typically with palm, you will take, let's say, molecules that are off, and then you shine 405 nanometer UV, and there is a photoisomerization that happens, and then now they become on. And usually they would emit, let's say, in the green channel. Right? So the stochasticity 
is in that 405 conversion from off to on, right? And then once they come on, then you are activating them with the green laser so that you detect whichever one comes on. So you are now, what, what you have control over is the 405 nanometer um, intensity. Use a low enough 405 nanometer so that on average, you know, there is just such a low probability that two things will be turned on, right? So the depletion that we're talking about here is not photobleaching, but the depletion of the pool of photoactivation. So it's a, it's a bit subtle, right? The reason we get a gradual plateau is because over time, you just have less and less things that are photoactivatable, right? So now when a cluster does occur, just because that cluster occurs does not mean that all of a sudden you have changed the probability of every other protein that is diffusing around to be photoconverted. So that photoconversion process actually decouples your detection with the depletion process. If that, so it's a very, you know, it's a very good question. It's a very subtle thing, and, and this is exactly what we do. We use just our subtle knowledge to try to uncouple these things. So it's not photobleaching, for example. It's just that you, know, you have a certain probability of being photoactivated, and then if a cluster does occur, then you go in the frequency you know, the, or the time domain to try to see what's the frequency at which one molecule gets activated over the next. The, mm -hmm. shape like which it, the shape of the response that accumulates over time gives you the difference between. Yeah. Uh, the Fourier transform of that. Well, hopefully you don't even need a Fourier transform. Like the signal is so, you know, it, it's so obvious, right? So I will tell you, once we first started this, right, like I was a postdoc when, when I suggested this idea, I thought that we would have to go, in fact, in a Fourier space and then try to infer that these uh, differences are happening. But it just looks so striking, right? That uh, virtually no detection, then a cluster, you know, where you get a high frequency of detection, then no detection again. And then we can do different stimulation. You will see that will change uh, the lifetime also. So it turns out that this is, in fact, so striking that just a direct visualization, no further analysis is needed for you to tell that likely the cluster assembly happened here and likely disassembled here. But you're actually bringing up another point that uh, you know, one of the students, uh, Owen Andrews in my lab, is inferring. Let's say now that you have a cluster that is there and is sustained, but then within that cluster there is high dynamic changes. In fact, you know, the theory will tell you that you should be able to go to Fourier space and now infer on, you know, on further dynamics even than what we've uh, inferred on. But right now, everything I'm going to tell you about is, you know, you can just look in this TC palm traces and tell. All right, let me just double check with the audio, audio visual people. Is there a problem that we should be aware of or? Is there a problem we should be aware of or are we good? Okay, all right. That, that's also a very good question. So I will tell you, again, when I was a postdoc and I saw this signature, the way that it even came about was because I was thinking that when clusters happen, surely they're stable. Because uh, Rick talked about this idea that, uh, you know, decades ago people have hypothesized this transcription factory models, right, where you get protein clusters that can be seen in fixed cell but cannot be seen in live cell yet. So I thought, okay, well, it must have just been a resolution problem, right, like not a dynamic problem, that once we can now see these clusters, surely they're stable and then all they're doing is just moving around. So there is something that you can do in uh, super resolution, which is... Um, um, like a time-dependent window averaging method, like a sliding window analysis. So let's say you take your 10,000 frames, but then you say, I'm going to take just the first 1,000 frames and then represent that first 1,000 frames. 
right? And the cluster will be there. And then accept that as I start to slide that window, I may get some photo bleaching effect, but if I just take that 1,000 frames and then move it just by 10 frames or so, I will still get a lot of overlap, right? And so what should happen, it, it should just be that if you start to do the sliding window, your cluster is there, you will start now to track it. So it turns out you can actually do tracking even with the super resolution approach with the sliding window. And that's what I thought would happen. And guess what I saw? I, you put a sliding window here, there was nothing. Then boom, something happened, and then boom, it disappeared, right? So that was actually one of the first telling signs for me to even think about you know, how best to represent uh, the, the, this idea that, oh my God, these things are highly dynamic and we really need to find out a better way to you know, visualize them, but also see whether they play any functional role later on. Very good. Other questions? So, clusters are happening. Let me just tell you a conundrum and then we can take a break and then come back, all right? So clusters are happening and from this kind of TC palm trace, you can estimate when cluster assembled. You see when it seems to disassemble, right? So you can estimate the cluster lifetime, right? So that means that you can do that for many different clusters from many different uh, cells that you image and then plot this histogram of the cluster sizes and then you can calculate all types of parameters from this histogram. The simplest thing is to say, what's the average cluster lifetime? And the average cluster lifetime seems to be about eight seconds. Okay. So, eight seconds can be a really long time or a really short time depending on who you're talking to, right? You, you have your hand up, is that a question? Or, or you're thinking that it could be a long, what do you think? Do you think it's a long or a short time? Let me ask you. Exactly, it depends on the process we're talking about. So let's remind ourselves what we're talking about. We're talking about RNA polymerase II, a molecular machine, right, that binds to DNA and then tracks on DNA to make an RNA copy, right? And we can think about then the speed of this elongation process. It's about 2,500 base pairs per minute. And a typical mammalian gene size is about 10,000 base pairs, right? Well, so it should take several minutes to even finish one messenger RNA. So in fact, when we first published this paper at the end of my postdoc, right, a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, TC Palm, it's such a clever way of uh, you know, doing super resolution live cell and extracting dynamic information, but too bad that what they discovered here with the pol 2 clustering is too dynamic to play any relevant role in the transcription process. They found things that are just a few seconds long, right? whereas a transcription process, even to make one messenger RNA, should take minutes. right? So, what I will tell you is that then I started my own lab and had uh, my own uh, trainees join my lab and they had a very different opinion from the rest of the community on what this eight seconds could be doing. So I'm just looking at the time. So maybe we can take a break here, Sarah? Okay, we can take a five minutes break and then when we come back, I will ask you guys to think about how you would think about addressing this, whether it plays a functional role or not. Okay, so let's take a five minutes break and then. Okay, we'll start exactly at noon. All right, thanks. Like you're a little bit, uh, you know, tired. You just stood up, right? Okay, come on, everybody, stand up again. Come on, stand up. Yeah, stretch out a bit. Jump around if you want, come on. Let's go, come on. It will help you out, you love it. Come on, let's go, let's go. G good, yeah, I know, fresh, that I can control. I, I teach the freshman physics class at MIT, right? And so, this is how we survive. Um, um, okay, so, 
We had gotten to this point where it's like, great, we can see Poltu forms these clusters in uh, uh, living cell nucleus. And then um, we measure this cluster lifetime. There's just a few seconds. And then a single transcription should take minutes. Is this even functional or not at all? What do you guys think? If you're talking about it, it is. <laughs> if I'm talking about it, it's functional. Wow, I can talk about Beyonce all the time. Do you think that would be functional also? <laughs> I, 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 I agree with you also. So, so, so let me think about this this way. You get these clusters and they're, you know, you think they're functional, but they just last a few seconds, right? And then you're part of a new lab that started in a physics department and uh, your PI says, if you think they're functional, how would we test that? What do you think? Try to disrupt the, the time. You can try to disrupt the time. What do you mean by that? I mean, if the eight second on average is functional, mm -hmm. something much shorter or much longer should be zero. So try to see some kind of correlation, right? So it turns out, in fact, and I will, tell, I will show you that, that one of the first experiments that uh, this trainee, Wonky Joe, did was to add a drug that blocks transcription. Now, when he adds this drug that blocks transcription, something that will last just a few seconds is now very stable. OK. So that starts to tell us that, in fact, maybe there is something to pursue. But are you satisfied just by that? OK, so what else would you do? You're shaking your head no. Um, I mean, we can also talk ideally, right? Because remember, if you are a young lab in a physics department also, the point is just sometimes you put the goal, the technology is not there, then you push yourself to develop that technology. So let's say ideally, what would you want to see? And then we'll talk about whether the technology is there to answer that question. Yeah. 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 So do a stimulation, and uh, Rick told you a little earlier about uh, this idea of using um, uh, cancer cells, right, as a teller for whether something is important. And in fact, what I can tell you about that is that when I did this work, right, again, remember I was a physics graduate student who, that was the first time I worked with cells. I basically asked, what are the most resilient cells that a physicist can learn on? And I was told cancer cells are very resilient. So this first study was actually done in cancer cells. And if you stimulate these cancer cells with uh, with uh, a serum, for example, where you know there is a global upregulation of many different response factors, this average lifetime in the cancer cells increases by an order of magnitude. So that's also indicative of that, that there is definitely something important. And I saw another hand there. Yeah? <laughs> Okay, so by this time, 2013, this was the first time that one could even see these clusters by cell culture in a living cells. I didn't ask my trainees, although if you want to join my lab, to go and do that in a living animal. Um, I think now maybe we can ask that question. <laughs> oh, oh, in vitro. Um, so reconstructions, to be honest, only now do we have collaborators like uh, Rick Young's lab that are you know, much better at genetics and the biochemistry, and we can even think about doing these reconstructions uh, in vitro, but it's coming. So, but you were asking me earlier also that you think they may play a role, so how would you test that? If you think this thing is functional, how would you want to check that out? So different perturbations, right? And it turns out, actually, most of the perturbations you can think of 
will affect this lifetime. Okay. So is that satisfactory? Yeah? Can you look at that all they form just out of curiosity? Where they form? What do you mean? On on, on the with respect to the genome, not on the genome. Yeah. Okay. Like where every single one of this is. I would love to know that. There is a there is another hand there, yeah. I would I mean I'm not dismissing, I'm saying I would love to know that, yeah. Do an RNA fish. So somehow if this is happening and there is a transcription happening here, wouldn't you want to know that there is transcription happening? So in fact Wonky Cho did that and then he convinced me that there was transcription happening at least under one of the main genes which had been studied, it was the beta actin gene. So then he said even better, right, that not only can you do fish which would require you to fix the cell, he said people can label the RNA in a living cell also. Do you know how? So this so-called MS2 loops, right? So for People that don't know, the idea is this. Let's say you have your gene of interest. You take that gene of interest and you insert an external sequence in the DNA, right? So now the polymerase is making the RNA. So the part of the genome that is the normal part, the endogenous part, is being made here. But when it arrives at the cassette that you inserted, the RNA of that inserted sequence will start forming these loops, okay? And these loops, it turns out, are specifically recognized by a protein that comes from phage, which is just like a virus for a bacteria. It's not available, that protein is not available in eukaryotes, so it's great. It's available in phage, so you can express it in your cell and if that protein is labeled, it will come in and bind these loops. So basically, you get a fluorescent protein that decorates your RNA. Right? And people like uh, in uh, Rob Singer's lab have used this to even trace single RNA molecules that are moving around inside a cell. But most importantly, what they show is that whereas single RNA may be moving around inside the, the cell nucleus, for example, at the place where the RNA is being made, for genes where there is a burst, so that means that there is a few messenger RNA that are being made at the same time, those messenger RNAs are still bound to chromatin, so they're not diffusive, but there's also many of them. So it becomes a, a bright, immobile locus. So you can use the MS2 signal to even tell where the active gene is located inside your cell. Does this make sense? So you use not just the brightness, but the diffusional analysis. See, for example, over the same short time frame of the movie, a single RNA may have diffused this much or this much, but at the place where the RNA is being made, it's fairly mobile because it's still anchored to a fairly mobile or relatively mobile uh, chromatin context. And then by brightness and diffusional analysis, you can guess that those are probably where the gene loci are. Yes? Oh, if I say immobile? Yes, if I say mobile, I mean instantaneously. So clearly, these RNAs that are diffusing around are coming from here and they've left and new ones are being made. And what I mean is that at any given time, you can estimate how many nascent messenger RNAs. So you're right, like at any given time, you can estimate how many nascent messenger RNAs are bound here. And in fact, that's how people will do these burst estimates. It's like on average, four messenger RNA are bound. Yeah? Does this correlate in time with the previous result that you found with excitement? Okay, that would be great, right? And again, that's what Wonky asked now. So let's see. Okay, so Wonky says, right, like he takes this beta actin, so by now we're collaborating with uh, people from a single lab where you can see the gene locus inside a single plane, right? RNA is labeled in one color. You can go and 
focus exactly in that plane, then you can do super resolution in that one color to better localize that gene locus in the living cell with nanometer accuracy. Inside that same cell, polymerase is available and it's labeled in a different color. And you are in the same cell in exactly the same plane, now in a different color. By the way, if you look at the polymerase by conventional microscopy, this is what people will normally see, right? But you can do super resolution now to reveal all the clusters that are happening exactly in that same plane, in the nucleus. Presumably, cluster can happen at di different loci that you've not labeled, right? Different genes that were not, you didn't insert the MS to add. But you know at least where one of those active gene lo locus is. So then you can ask whether a cluster is happening exactly at that gene locus, and indeed it is. So these transient clusters are happening at least in part on active gene loci, right? But it still didn't tell you, right, whether there is any correlation, which is the question you asked. So it turns out that this gene, beta-actin, as I say, it's one of the most well-studied genes in terms of uh, its bursting process, and especially with this MS2 tagging. And you can use that information to try to see if there is any correlation. So this gene would burst on average once every, let's say, five to 10 minutes. And when a bursting occurs, on average, four messenger RNAs are made on that gene. Okay? And then, you can stimulate the cells, for example, with serum, and that burst size can go up, up to fourfold. So we thought, why not do the same type of dual color super resolution, but now analyzing the cluster dynamics that happens on the gene as a function of time on what you expect for the gene output. I think this is just lost. <laughs> um, let's see. OK, it's back on. So for this particular stimulation, five minutes after stimulation, you expect the same basal output. All right. Um, so five minutes after stimulation, um, you expect the same basal output, right? And uh, Won Wonky looked at the cluster happening. When Wonky looked at the the cluster happening, and he looked at the cluster lifetime, it was a few seconds. I'll try to speak into the microphone. I'm, I'm normally loud anyway. Can anyone, everyone hear me here? OK. So five minutes after stimulation, basal output, he looks at the cluster by TC Palm. You know, it's, a few, it's that few seconds, let's say about. Then 15 minutes after stimulation, you would expect a fourfold increase in the RNA output. You would expect a fourfold increase in the RNA output. He looks at the cluster that happens there, and he seems to see about a fourfold increase in the cluster lifetime. And I say, that's too coincidental. So show me 25 minutes or 30 minutes later when you relax back, right? It keeps going on and off. So, and so I remember telling Wonky this, right? I was like, oh, this sounds so promising, right? But whenever the Singer lab is doing this uh, analysis, usually they show you the number of messenger RNA as a function of time after stimulation. It's like four messenger RNA per burst, and increase about fourfold 15 minutes later, and then comes back to the basal level. And they measure that for up to an hour. Right? So why don't you go and do this correlation for an hour and we can see it continuously rather than just this three time point. Right? And you know, I realize this that for many of my students, and I have a couple here, so you know, maybe I shouldn't say my trick in front of them. That for students, usually, even if you know something is impossible, you just set the bar there and then wait for them to be clever and cross it somehow and they will make the impossible happen. So here's what Wonky did. 
he reminded me of the cold reality that, look, when you're doing this, you really have a couple minutes of imaging. After about a couple minutes, you photo bleach enough that you really don't trust your data anymore, right? And during these about two to three minutes, you're doing super resolution to try to localize the gene in one color in a living cell, then a second super resolution to look at whether there's a cluster there, right? And then after that, that's it, you're done. You cannot even look at the same cell past that couple minutes. So forget about doing this, you know, response for up to an hour. But as I say, with students and uh, other trainees, you just set the goal, and then the next day, they will surprise you. So one kid did just that. The next day, he came back. He told me, I got it. So I'm like, what? You solved the super resolution limit problem? He's like, no, no, no. But he said, when you're doing the serum stimulation, you actually have a synchronized time point at time zero, right? You stimulate it at time zero. So you can stimulate a whole bunch of cells at time zero. You still have only two minutes to look at each cell, but you can record when after the stimulation you looked at them. Right? So that's what monkey is plotting here. So now, stimulation happens at time zero. So this is as a function of time after stimulation. And then he's recording what was the cluster, average cluster lifetime that happened for a cell after a certain stimulation time. So the cluster lifetime is a few seconds. I don't know if you guys can see the open circles here. Can some of you, okay. We don't want you to focus on them. But each one of them is a cluster where Wong Yi saw that there was a cluster localizing at that gene locus. He records when after stimulation that cell was imaged and he saw that cluster. And how long that cluster lasted. And he does that for many cells that he imaged within the first five minutes, and that's, those are all the white dots there. You can see it's quite noisy. And then he averages them, and that's the data in black. So if you look at the cell and look at the cluster happening, on average, the cluster lasted about eight seconds. Is that okay? So then, you can look at many different cells for up to an hour after that stimulation. And then this was what we saw. There is a basal cluster lifetime of about eight seconds. There is an increase about fourfold and a decrease back to the basal level, right? This is very reminiscent of what the Singer lab had seen for this particular gene output. In fact, because we know the brightness of a single RNA molecule, we know the brightness of the gene locus, we can estimate also, as a function of time after stimulation our own experiment, on average, how many nascent messenger RNAs are being made. So that's what we're estimating here. From the brightness of a single RNA molecule, you can see we reproduce exactly what the single lab had seen before. On average, four messenger RNA per burst an increase about fourfold, and a decrease back to the basal level, again, as a function of time after stimulation. Right. This was known before. What was not known was that there was a transient cluster happening below the diffraction limit at that gene locus that correlated with this uh, gene output. There are a few qualitative differences. If you look at this as an input and this as an output, for example, the input would be narrower than the output, and this is a signature, perhaps, of a, you know, a noisy process, right? But if you look also consistently, Wonky sees that the peak pole two happens shortly before the peak RNA output. Again, this is consistent with a process that should happen before you detect the RNA output. And this separation, thank you so much, no worries. This separation of about two and a half minutes is exactly consistent with how long it will take for 
a process that happens at the transcription start site may be loaded polymerases, and for these polymerases to elongate at the rate of about 2,500 base pairs per minute before it arrives to the end of the gene, where we put this MS2 tag and we'll see the RNA output. Is that okay? So these are now two measurements that are made on the same cell on the same gene. So we can try to see, right, like they look correlated, but we want to know how well correlated they are. So we can now plot this information, right, looking at how long the cluster lasted and how many messenger RNA came out after the delay that, you, that we saw. And we seem to see this linear correlation suggesting that although the cluster lasts just a few seconds, the longer the cluster is there, right, proportionately more messenger RNA will come out later on. So what do we think is happening? We think that this classical textbook picture, right, that a single molecule is diffusing around and may ultimately find other cofactors to bind and start transcribing, it could still be happening, but it's probably too inefficient, especially for genes that we know can respond almost immediately upon an external signal, right? So many response genes and genes are important for development, for example, and maintaining a cell, cell status. So we suspect for those genes that they could utilize a clustering of the polymerase, perhaps just during initiation, simply to increase the local concentration of the polymerase, which will facilitate the loading of the polymerases, right? And then what our data suggests is that for every two seconds that the cluster is there, one polymerase may be properly loaded, such that the cluster lasts just on average about eight seconds. It's enough time to load about four polymerases. And then after a few loading events, the cluster disassembles. Cluster is gone after eight seconds. Those four loaded polymerases can then now go and elongate at the normal pole to elongation rate and then make the RNA. Yes? Uh, this is going a bit backwards, but to what extent um, That's a very good question. Let me see. Hmm, how are we doing on time? I, I, I want to show you something about that. So the question is, to what extent is phosphorylation governing all this? I want to show you this. So is it okay if I show you guys that and then on my talk on Monday we'll talk about the uh, phase separation aspect? Is that okay? Everybody happy? Yeah? Okay, good. Because I think that's important. So hold on to that and I will talk about it just, just next. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you mentioned it. Uh, on your polymerase clustering, mm -hmm. you able as a reference for the intensity of one on average get the number of polymerases clustering? Yes, so that's right. So the idea is how, you know, can we estimate how many polymerases are there? It turns out the better way to do that just for technical re reason is that you actually try to fix the cell and get a snapshot. Because the idea is that if the cluster disassemble very rapidly and individual molecules can go in and out, then you never actually get a real count of the static number. So that's how we estimate that in this particular cluster for the, for the beta actin gene, there were on average 80 polymerases that came in. They lasted about eight seconds and then they, you know, four messenger RNA came, came out. So we can do that estimation. So then, let's say you stimulate the cell, right? And then the cell wants to get more messenger RNA out of the gene. So then what should happen is that you just hold the cluster n times longer, given the opportunity to load n times more proteins, right? Which will then give you n times more messenger RNA. Does that make sense? Okay. So this simple picture explains everything that we've seen here, from why the cluster would happen exactly at the gene locus to why you would get this 
linear correlation that the longer you hold the cluster, the more proportionately more polymerases may be loaded and therefore proportionately more messenger RNA will come out, the delay at which it comes out, and then even this uh, time-dependent modulation. That if you do stimulation, we don't quite understand yet how the cell is controlling all of this, but the end effect of the stimulation seems to be to take a cluster that will normally last just a few seconds, but then hold it progressively longer, and then at some point you then change that to bring it back to the basal level of about eight seconds again. And that would also correlate with the RNA output that you see here. Okay, so to what extent, the question was, to what extent do we think that phosphorylation, right, kinase-based phosphorylation may be responsible for this? So I want to show you one experiment that uh, Wonky did. So remember, by this time, we don't know how the cell is creating the clusters. We don't know how the cell is controlling the clusters. But somehow, what we know is that the presence of the clusters correlates with RNA output. And somehow, if you can hold the clusters, you, you can control how many mRNA come out. So Wonky said, look, we know from the Singer lab again, right, this was what I showed you before, like clockwork, if you stimulate the cell at this time, this particular gene is going to change its RNA output in this very stereotypical manner, right? Where it picks 15 minutes after the stimulation and it comes back down. So he said, what about doing the same experiment, but before you reach this peak, he would add a drug called DRB. And what does DRB do? It turns out when a polymerase is loaded, it goes in a transcription, uh, pr so sorry, it goes in a promoter proximal pause state and waits for the so called positive transcription elongation factor to bring in a kinase CDK9, which phosphorylates the C terminal tail of the largest subunit of the polymerase. Okay? This DRB competes with a the ATP binding in CDK9, prevents phosphorylation, and therefore effectively blocks a polymerase here. Okay? So, presumably a cluster has formed, you load a polymerase, but now you add this drug the polymer is going to promote a proximal pulse state. Phosphorylation is prevented. Okay. What do you think should happen to the RNA output? So let's think about it. Polymerase is loaded. It's paused now. Can new polymerases be loaded onto the gene? No. So what should happen if you're watching the RNA output? It should go down, right? So in fact, the ones that were already loaded will finish elongating. So in fact, I think you will see that in one key's data that it would even go up for a bit, but then it will come back down. So shortly after DRB, he sees this and it goes back down. So I thought this was actually perfect because we could test one of the main ten tenets of uh, you know, this whole idea. When we draw the cluster, we draw it as a cloud around, right? We don't draw it as, you know, that the clusters we're seeing are elongating polymerases. Well, this is perfect because with the CDK9 inhibitor, gene bodies are empty and you can do chip seek and it will confirm that. All the gene bodies are empty, right? There is no more elongating polymerase after a couple of minutes. So we can test whether there is still a cluster even when there is no elongating polymerases, right? Which would suggest that the clusters, in fact, are not elongating polymerases. What do you guys think? You can guess by the way I asked the question that it's, it's there, right? So cluster is still there. But here was the surprise. 
not only was a cluster there, but look at the TC Palm trace of the cluster. Okay, you guys are all TC Palm experts now. How would you interpret this? I hear it. It's stable, right? So look at this. Like slope onset from the beginning of acquisition followed by a gradual plateau, just like the fixed cell cluster that I showed you before as an example. So this actually changed my view, right? I used to think that maybe the reason these clusters disassemble within a few seconds is because it's energetically unfavorable to form the clusters and hold them there. But this experiment actually tells me not only are the clusters not elongating polymerases, but when the clusters form, they may actually be stable normally, right? And it's the, perhaps the phosphorylation events that promote the transcription activity that could play a role as a feedback to disassemble the cluster, such that if you block these phosphorylation events, you're also blocking the disassembly of the clusters. Yes? Then could you uh, like use like a more diluted uh, in order to build up the clusters and then actually increase transcription? Yeah, so we're hoping. So, so one thing that I will tell you that we've learned ever since, right? I, could, I, I would say this was already starting to gear us towards uh, what Rick talked about this morning, right? That, um, you know, first of all, that C-terminal domain is the low complexity domain, right, for, for Apollo 2. And the fact that that C-terminal domain may play a role in modulating whether the cluster is there or not, right, was first an idea, right? Then you go like, oh my God, this could in fact be, you know, the same type of uh, things that people were talking about in terms of phase separation. Then the second thing is, what creates those phases and how can we use the C-terminal domain to put things in or out? So I believe Rick will talk about this uh, uh, maybe in his talk. The more recent data in a paper that should, I think it's coming out now in Nature, right? More recent data is telling us that not only will you get polymerase going into these uh, enhancer condensates when it's unphosphorylated, but when you phosphorylate it, actually, you can partition it into a different condensate, which is RNA processing condensates, splicing condensates. So, in fact, the emergent story you will, you, what, that you will hear at, the, at this conference is that, you know, these pol 2 clusters that we're talking about are probably happening with enhancer association, you know, alongside, I will talk about in my own talk, mediator condensate. And then the phosphorylation process could be a way of not just controlling whether the cluster is there or not, right, but whether pull two partitions into enhancer condensates that maybe are transcription initiating or other condensates for RNA processing downstream of the gene. And the thing that I will add here is to say that the DRB, of course, again, we're a lab of physicists. We think of that as a potent inhibitor of CDK9, but it's probably not as potent as we think. Probably we're blocking a whole bunch of uh, other kinases. So we're very excited to see what, you know, drugs maybe that are more selective for you know, CDK9 versus CDK7 versus other, you know, other kinases, or maybe even what specific modifications we can make to the C-terminal domain, right? Rick started his whole career doing modifications on these uh, C-terminal domains and studying them. So we're hoping to revive all that back and rethink about it in this context, because it could, in fact, be just that, you know, that's how the cell is doing that, that you get these low-complexity domains and you can use phosphorylation and other modifications to tune not just the presence of these clusters, which could have a downstream effect on the gene output, but also where this polymerase is lo localized and why it's localized there. So there was just one last bit that, that, that I want to do uh, here, and then we can conclude. So uh, 
Here's what I told Wonky when, when he showed me this. I said, wait a second. This is in life cell, right? You mean to tell me that at a time when the cell may not be expecting, so you can basically wait, right? At a time when the cell may not be expecting to do another bursting event, right? That you have successfully stabilized a cluster at the gene locus, right? And this DRB is washable. So what happens then if you wait just a little bit and then wash away the drug? So let's think about this. You stimulated the cell, you added the drug here, it never arrives to the peak, and then it goes back down. But it goes back down in a way that you've also stabilized a cluster that is staying there, and the POL2 is stuck here. OK? So now you can wash away DRB. What do you think will happen? So let's think about it. Polymerase is stuck here because of the effect of DRB. So you wash away DRB. What should happen to this polymerase? OK, so actually, we don't know exactly whether it falls off or it starts transcribing. But whatever the case, it's unblocking. So then, according to our model, the cell doesn't really know what's going on, right? All it knows is that there is this high concentration of cluster that is right here, right? So according to our simple physics model, what should happen? You have a high concentration. Gene, uh, you know, promoter is, is uh, or transcription start site is open. What should happen? Transcription, right? So another multiple loading route. So I say, do you really think that you can stimulate another gene output by just washing away this thing? And here's what he showed me. He washes away. There is a delay consistent with how long it takes to wash away this drug. And in fact, he sees another peak bursting. In fact, he started playing around that he can wait you know, almost an indefinite period of time right, to move when this peak happens. It, in fact, just depends on when you wash, so wash away. So let me summarize uh, here. So we found that transient pol 2 clusters happen in mice, and we've seen it in mice and human cell uh, so far. Like we, and we know that these clusters occur on active gene lo loci. And we also see that there is a direct predictive correlation between how long the cluster is there and how many mRNA comes out. Although we cannot control when the cluster is forming and we cannot control how long the cluster is there, with this DRB-based experiment, we can control at least that if we can change the timing the presence or absence of the cluster, we can also control that gene bursting at will. So this is uh, where I will stop by telling you that then on Monday, we'll pick up exactly from, uh, from, from this point, And uh, we will look at not just what happens with polymerase at the promoter, but now we will interrogate what happens with mediator at the enhancer. And, and maybe that's where you know, some of these ideas of what Rick uh, has been talking about will come about. So I wanted to finish by thanking really um, a fantastic lab. So this is uh, the lab a few weeks ago. Uh, Ming is here. And uh, Chungmen was on vacation when we took uh, this picture. Um, you know, please, please talk talk with them if there is uh, any collaborations and things that you want to actually do. They are the ones who actually do <laughs> the research. And uh, we have a very young and dynamic uh, lab. And um, in fact, this has been one of the biggest pleasure for me starting my, my own group. It's this ability of recruiting such young talents that are able to look at the data themselves and read the papers themselves and say, I don't believe what the field believes. I think there is a different thing. And they go on and you know, really push the microscopy and really push themselves even in the biology to uncover these processes. But the thing about it is that then they're so good that there is such a quick turnover. right? So all the super resolution data that I showed you today were acquired and analyzed by uh, Wong Ki Cho who has now moved on to start uh, as an assistant professor at KAIST. Uh, 
and uh, on Monday I will tell you about uh, lattice light sheet imaging that was developed by uh, Jan Hendrik Spille, uh, who now just moved to become an assistant professor of physics at uh, University of Illinois Chicago. And if I have uh, some time at the end on Monday, I also want to tell you about work that was done by uh, Arjun Narayanan um, on looking at the mechanism of uh, uh, phase uh, separation, in particular the condensation phenomenon, where most physicists would think of as a first order phase transition through classical nucleation theory. And can we really think about that, like an equilibrium-based process happening inside a cell also? So I will try to you know, organize my 25 minutes talk on Monday to, to show you a bit of that. Um, this was done in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, people like Rick Young, Phil Sharp, and uh, Arup Chakraborty. And we have a fantastic group at the Physics of a Living System. So these are physicists in the physics department who are doing exclusively biophysics. We have the labs, uh, experimental labs of Jeff Gore, Nick Tafakri, and my lab, as well as uh, theory groups like Arup Chakraborty, Miran Kardar, and uh, Leonid Murney. I highly encourage you to join us. And I want to finish again by really um, thanking uh, TJ Ha and my family, I would say, really, at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Like these ideas of looking at weak and transient interactions at the single molecule level. In fact, that's the title of my thesis that I wrote 10 years ago. And it was only possible to do that through the encouragement of people like uh, TJ and the support from the NSF in, in this Physics Frontier Center that can give the freedom to young people to pursue their own ideas and their own craziness, even when you know, people will tell them, but you cannot do weak and transient interaction at the single molecule level, or you cannot do super resolution with, uh, you know, in life cell. And I think you know, that's the opportunity that you guys have through this kind of uh, network of interactions and this kind of support to really pursue your own ideas that may seem crazy right now, but in 10 years, you would be the one giving the talks on where the field is at right now. So I thank you for all your questions. There's been a lot of interactions. So thank you all again. And uh, I'll be around, of course, to talk. Thank you.